Good morning and God bless you. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank thee so for this day that thou has given, uh, the life that you have given us in Christ for our Savior. We just want, as we open thy word, that his name would be honored, that he would have the preeminence. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're in uh, this morning in Exodus chapter 18. Uh, we had just seen this great reunion between uh, Moses and his family, his wife and two sons, and uh, his father-in-law Jethro. And uh, uh, we ended with a, a worship meeting, uh, praising the Lord with Jethro included for all that God had done for Israel. Now in verse 13, Exodus 18, verse 13, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses, father-in-law, said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, uh, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach the ordinances and laws, shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So, so shall it be easier for thyself and, thy, that, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all the people shall also go to their place in peace. And Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Uh, now we can all agree that it would be better if that verse said, so Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law according to the commandment of God. But it doesn't say that. It says that he simply followed his father-in-law Jethro's counsel and advice. Was he wrong? You know, there's many things that we, decisions we make in this life that are not right or wrong as far as a, a, a moral question. It's a, not a question of sin or not sinning. It's a question of judgment. And there's many things that until the judgment seat of Christ, when all of us as believers will stand before the Lord, not for our sins, hallelujah, those were paid for by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, we've been justified. But we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ, to be judged according to our works the lives that we've lived and the things that we've done, whether it be gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, uh, the day will bring it to light. And uh, so we want, obviously, to make uh, judgments and decisions that are right before the Lord and to do work that he has called us to do. And so uh, we want to be sure that whenever we get counsel, that we bring it before the Lord and uh, take it to the Word of God and see if it's consistent with the Word of God. Uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, remember, he was like an adopted father to Moses. Uh, Moses had not known his father when he was growing up in, in the uh, Pharaoh's palace, you remember. 
And uh, um, so here he is, and he's a stranger in a strange land. Jethro brings him into his home, uh, gives him his daughter to wife, uh, teaches him the business for 40 years of shepherding, uh, how many nights that uh, they spent together, you know, in that day, uh, before all the activity that we have in our lives and all uh, the internet and television and all these things uh, uh, that uh, occupy our time, relationships were important. Uh, stories of what happened during the day were told. And uh, uh, it's, it's a wonderful time. It's like if you go camping with your family and you sit around the campfire and you, you tell stories. And so this is the way those, uh, their lives were. And Moses no doubt loved Jethro deeply and respected him immensely. And uh, it's something to think about if you happen to be considering getting married, that you don't just marry that man or that woman, but you marry them, of course, and their family comes along. So you're going to have in-laws if you get married, and you need to be, consider that before you get married. You need, need to be on good terms with them. And it's a joy, as we see here, uh, when a man like Moses uh, gets along well uh, with his uh, father-in-law. And uh, that's a great blessing. So uh, Moses now was um, uh, involved every day. Now, we don't know how this started out, uh, if it was a few that came to Moses and asked for counsel uh, or uh, for him to make decisions about things. Uh, maybe someone had, <laughs> had a sheep that had got into someone's tent and broken things up and there's an argument about it. Uh, maybe someone had borrowed something from his neighbor and didn't return it or, or uh, damaged it uh, when he brought it back. Uh, maybe some argument in the family that had broken out and they couldn't settle it, whatever it was. Uh, there are things that they brought to Moses. And uh, before long, you know, you've got uh, between a million, two million people, uh, you've got uh, uh, a lot of people that are coming to Moses. It was all day long. And Jethro watched this and he said, oh, Moses, uh, this is not good. You're going to wear yourself out doing this. And he makes a suggestion and he uh, really lays out for Moses, what he thinks, Jethro thinks he should do, and that is to delegate the authority to uh, other men, and not just any other men, but as uh, Jethro describes them, men uh, in verse 21, men that fear God, uh, men of truth, hating covetousness. So here's three moral attributes that these men are to have. They're to be men that fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. You know, when we think of the church today and church government, because this is really what it is, this is a, uh, those that would be making decisions uh, regarding the lives of these uh, Israelites. In the church, we have overseers, we have uh, uh, elders is another term for them, and we find their qualifications given in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And the qualifications have to do with godliness, just like we have here. Uh, men that are godly, men that know the word, men that have had families themselves and have brought them up so that as a father, uh, he would know how to uh, oversee the family of God and have good judgment and wisdom. And it was always a plurality elders in every assembly in the, uh, the uh, New Testament church. And so here we have that type of, of, of consideration here. But it was uh, as if Jethro came in. He had not been a part of the deliverance out of Egypt. He had not seen it. Uh, he was not a Jew. And he came in and saw all that had taken place now, just in this moment, moment regarding uh, Moses uh, and the way he was conducting a business, and he gives a suggestion. So uh, he's like a consultant <laughs> that you might bring in uh, to your business or an advisor or a counselor comes into your family, and uh, they have to 
find out what's going on. So Jethro makes a, a, a recommendation. And because Moses so respects him, uh, and because no doubt Moses was uh, worn down at the end of the day after hearing uh, all of the problems that people had in making these decisions, uh, that it sounded like a good idea. Now, they had just had a worship meeting, uh, Moses and his uh, Jethro and the elders of Israel back in verse 12, they had already gotten together and had a worship meeting before God. It would have been good had they had a prayer meeting regarding uh, this uh, um, suggestion, recommendation that Jethro gave, but we don't read that they did. Uh, I, I just want to say something about good intentions. Uh, good intentions uh, are just that. They have good intent, but it doesn't mean necessarily it's the right thing to do or that it's the will of God. Uh, I was thinking in uh, first, uh, first Samuel, uh, second Samuel, second Samuel chapter uh, seven. Well, we'll go to six first. In second Samuel chapter six, you remember when David was going to bring in the Ark of the Covenant uh, to, is to Jerusalem? And uh, the, the Ark had been for some 47 years in the house of Abinadab. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, it says in verse 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. And verse 4, And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David is, and Israel, they're, they're, um, uh, they have instruments and they're accompanying the ark. Verse 6, now when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to, uh, to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ox shook it, or the ox stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Well, well now, someone had a good idea, they thought. They had good intentions. Uh, uh, David had the will of God in his heart and mind, and that was to bring the ark to Jerusalem. But someone said, well, how are we going to bring it? You know, it's, it's heavy, and, and Abinadab's house has been there for 47 years. They probably felt somewhat possessive of the ark. No doubt it was their uh, idea to put it on a new cart. And Uzzah, you know, accompanied uh, the uh, ark walking alongside that cart, that wagon. But when the ox stumbled, then he put forth his hand. He touched the ark of God. The ark of God represents the very presence of God, the very throne of God. It was never even to be seen. It was always covered uh, with the curtain, uh, as, as you, the veil, as you walked into the tabernacle, uh, the Holy of Holies. That veil would be taken down and the house of Aaron would come forward and cover uh, the, uh, the ark. So they never saw it. And so now it's placed upon a new ark, but uh, a new cart. But it was to always to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. There were rings on the ark of the covenant for that purpose, for staves to go through it, and then the priest, four priests, would carry it. But someone had a good idea, but they never checked the word of God. After Uzzah died. David went back to the Word of God, and he discovered the error that they had not called the priest to carry the ark. So it was good intentions, but it wasn't the will of God. It wasn't God's way. In the very next chapter, we have something similar. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, It came to pass, this is David, when the king, David, sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, now Nathan was David's good friend, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. Now David had in his heart to build uh, the temple for God. And 
his um, friend, his close friend, Nathan, says to him, David, great idea. Do whatever's in your heart. And here are two godly men. They want God to be glorified. And so they agree together, this is what we'll do. But, in verse 4, And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And in all the places wherein I have walked with the children of Israel, spake a word. He goes on about building me a house. This is, this is so beautiful just to take note of what God said. I've walked. I've, I've lived in a tent. I've been a, 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 a pilgrim. Uh, oh, with my people. And now God says, did I ever say anything about building a house for me, a temple? In Isaiah 66, he, he said uh, that heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? Where is my resting place? Hath not my hand made all these things, saith the Lord? In other words, God says, listen, I'm God, the creator. Uh, nice thought to make some place for me, but I need nothing. Now, uh, it's not to minimize what David had in his heart, because later on, uh, God honors David's desire to build him a house. He doesn't allow David to build the temple, because David was a man of war who had shed blood. God tells him that, but he allows his son to build it. But David was not discouraged. He used all his energy and his might to get together everything that was necessary to build that temple. He had all the plans. He brought together all the gold, silver, all the wood, everything that was needed in order to build the temple. So uh, this thing here was, um, it was a good idea, but it, it lacked God's stamp of approval. Everything that we do We've got to take before the Lord and to make sure that it's not only um, good intentions, but it's God's will. That it's not only good intentions, but, it, but it's done in the way that God has uh, for us to do it. Uh, and, and, and that's so important. So important. We all want that because we're talking once again about uh, not uh, evil and good, but about things that will be decided at the judgment seat of Christ, whether or not God was really leading in the things that we did. Uh, just going back uh, for a moment to Exodus 18, Jethro told him in verse 18, thou shalt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Um, it's very easy in life and in Christian service to get encumbered with many things. Uh, maybe we just look for a moment in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke and uh, chapter 9, chapter 10, with Mar uh, Mary and Martha bringing the Lord Jesus to their home. Uh, uh, I'll read in verse uh, Luke 10, verse 38. Now it came to pass... As they went, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her, her house. Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she helped me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Isn't that something that we all need to take note of? Uh, Martha was busy 
preparing uh, a dinner for the Lord. Mary was already sitting and enjoying a dinner, a dinner that the Lord had prepared for her. How necessary it is to understand that communion with the Lord is more important than service for him. In fact, if our communion with the Lord is not right and sweet, then our service that we do will somehow not be right. Our attitudes won't be right as Martha's attitude was not right. Her, her thoughts were all on uh, this getting something done. And, you know, we can, we can it's good to get things done. We, we don't want to be lazy. Uh, but Martha certainly wasn't lazy, but her, her view was about getting this supper prepared and all that was involved in that. And in doing that, she was missing out that better part of coming in and just setting all that aside, prioritizing being with this honored guest, the Lord Jesus. And you just wonder what Mary heard from his lips at that time that Martha didn't hear because she was cumbered about with much serving. Uh, so uh, the Lord uh, help us that we understand this. In fact, uh, Hebrews 12, just, just turn there for a moment. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now listen to this. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us and let us run the race with endurance. So you see there's a, a distinction made between weights and sins. Now, uh, sins are just that. They are morally wrong. But weights are not right or wrong, good or evil. They are just things that can slow us up in the race. And so it's very important in application. Thinking back to Moses, uh, he was weighted down with the service he was doing as being a judge to all those people. And Jethro saw that. We leave it to the judgment seat of Christ, whether uh, this should have happened in the way it happened. We read in Exodus 18 or, or whether Moses should have continued and got, until God changed it, if he did. Uh, but in any event, there are weights that things that we take upon ourselves that are not God's will. Uh, they're not uh, in line with our gifting. They're not in line with our calling. Uh, we might have good intentions in taking them on, and, uh, but what will happen is we'll lose communion. They'll become too heavy for us. We'll be complaining and, and bitter, looking at uh, other uh, believers and wondering why they're not coming alongside and helping and doing what I'm doing. It, it, it's just, it must be. Um, everything that we do must be for the Lord. It, it's, it's running a race with endurance. So we want to finish God's will for our lives. But in order to finish God's will, we have to be in God's will. And there can't be sins. There can't be those things that are wrong in our lives that are unconfessed, things that we're holding on to and we don't let go of. It doesn't have to be immorality that necessarily. It can be covetousness. It can be bitterness towards someone, an unforgiving spirit, whatever it is. But this thing of weights is so important. Let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us. And then he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, despised, I'm sorry, I better read this, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of God. Hallelujah. For consider him who endured such contradiction against himself, of sinners against himself. The Lord endured so much in the way of persecution. Consider that, the writer says, and you be not wearied and don't faint in your minds. So this is a race 
It's, it's not a sprint. The Christian life is a race, and it goes on a long time all your life. So we got to make sure that we are in God's will, that we're not adding to things in our lives that are not consistent with his will, not consistent with our calling, not consistent with our gifting. Do you understand that we can get, uh, uh, we can be doing in our minds the will of God, and it's good, but it's not God's perfect will for us because it's not according to our gifting. And that means something's being left out within the body of Christ. And so we want to take these things uh, very much to heart. And just one other uh, point to bring up out of Exodus 18 is these men uh, that uh, were chosen to be judges, uh, similar, I guess, to the court system that we have today, smaller, lesser courts, and then you can have appeal courts and so forth, uh, depending on, uh, on the crime and what's involved. Uh, but that there were these many judges that were there. And so we've mentioned already oversight, eldership within the assembly of God. I just want to look at one verse to encourage us how important it is. Uh, and, and in the day in which we live, we need to understand clearly that an overseer, an elder, a deacon in the church of God is, has a far higher calling than the president of the United States or any other official office. We're dealing with souls within God's church. Those that are in the place of responsibility within God's church, those that have been called to minister within God's church, those men have a calling that's far higher than being a president. In fact, if a man was an overseer within uh, God's church and, and stepped uh, and left that position in order to become president, he would have taken a great demotion. And we need to look at it that way. The most important entity in the world today is the living entity of the body of Christ, the church of God. And let us not get our eyes upon the governments of this world, which will eventually come to naught and come under judgment. Uh, rulers and leaders will come and they will go as they have in the past and God will bring them down because he's waiting until he will overturn all powers and all authority until his son comes, the one who is the rightful heir of the throne of this world and of heaven and in earth and earth. Hallelujah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Anyway, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 12, now this is talking about those elders. Uh, they were, as, as we read in Acts 20, the elders were the pastors, okay? Of, uh, uh, meaning those that, that cared for uh, the flock of God. It's, it's going back to that uh, picture of, of uh, a shepherd uh, and, and sheep. And so he says in verse 12 of, chapter, of 1 Thessalonians 5, and we beseech you, brethren, Paul speaking, we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. What an admonition. He says, we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you. Uh, every believer should know those within the house of God that are working in the work of the Lord. They should recognize that. It's our responsibility. Not because someone has a title, but because of the work that they're doing. Notice what he said. We beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. They're working within Christ's church. They're seeking to help the people of God. Now listen, all of us are to have that kind of attitude. All of us are to have a desire for the edification of the body of Christ. All of us are gifted 
in order that we might, as the individual member of Christ's body, that we might use our gifting for the help and encouragement of the body of Christ, for the edification of his body. But God has given men, uh, those that within the government of Christ's church, that they would rule. Now, not in the sense of rule like uh, authority. The authority is the word of God. But those men that would apply the word of God to every situation that comes up within Christ's church. I mean, just like we uh, uh, the situation we're in today. It, it's a, a wisdom to take what we see in the government and, and this uh, response to this pandemic and all that's going on and look into the word of God and to see what Christians should do. Now, that doesn't mean that there's going to be agreement about what that means, but it means that we are to search it out and we are to yield. Listen, whether or not we agree, uh, when we were in our families, we didn't always agree with our dads in their decision, but we are to yield to those that are in places of responsibility. And I tell you, at the judgment seat of Christ, that is going to be one of the issues that will be brought up amongst uh, uh, in our own personal responsibility is how we responded within Christ's church to the leadership of the Lord through brethren that he placed over us and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And all of us have brothers in mind that come to mind right now that we love in the Lord that have been such a blessing and such a gift in our lives. And we thank God for each and every one. Praise the Lord. So what we see with, with Moses uh, and, and his encounter with Jethro, that good intentions are not enough. We have to take everything and, and review it according to uh, God's word. And that we, don't, we want to make sure that we don't take on responsibilities that we're not called to do so that we become burdened and, and we can't run the race uh, uh, um, as we should with endurance because we're carrying this heavy load of responsibility that God has not given us. And we want to stay within his will. And then, of course, this, this thing that we thank God for every, uh, every brother that has uh, uh, taken responsibility, had in his heart a desire to build Christ's church, to be a help in Christ's church, just as David had it in his heart to build the house of God and worked with all his heart uh, to, uh, to build that house. So we're to honor those that likewise have a real concern for the body of Christ and uh, are being used in our lives. So thank the Lord for that, which we'll is close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you today that you have given us counselors, those that can look into our lives and, and apply the word of God, bring the word of God to us, wash our feet as it were, uh, bringing the word of God to us to help us. Maybe it's correction. Uh, maybe it's something that we just haven't seen in our lives. Maybe it's help regarding our ministry, whatever it might be. We don't want to be burdened, Lord. We want to be those that are able to work for thee and to run that race with endurance. And we don't want to look to men, no matter how great they are, but we look to the Lord, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, we honor thee, Lord. No one has walked the pathway of faith as thou hast. What? You are the perfect example. You are the perfect man. And that now we see thee victoriously at God's right hand. May we be encouraged in all that we've read in Scripture today, may the Holy Spirit apply it to our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.